This is Jim Bish with the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today's date is December 20th, 2021, and I am conducting an interview with Pete Roquet in Sun City West, Arizona. Pete, would you please give me your full name and where you were born? My name is Pete Roquet, and I was born in El Paso, Texas. Okay. And 1925. Thank you. And what war did you participate in? World War II. World War II. That's what we're looking for. Um, so, did, um, did you grow up then in El Paso? Is that where you were born? No, Jim. I um, grew up in uh, Central California. My mother died when I was four years old, and we came uh, to California where my grandmother lived. And uh, we moved to Central California, uh, near Fresno. Okay, it's a farming community. Farming community, from Bakersfield to Sacramento, that's all it is. Did your, um, were you involved in farming at all when you were growing up, or mostly lived in the city? Well, the Depression was on. <clears throat> and... Um, my folks were just following the, the fruit season, the uh, all kinds of uh, farm work in the Central Valley until um, until the war came, 1941, mm -hmm. and that basically that that slowed down the the uh, depression. A, a lot of migrants headed to Central California during the Depression to get oh, yeah, seasonal work, farm yeah. labor. They did, yes. There was a lot, a lot of uh, grapes, cotton, all kinds of fruit. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically the San Joaquin Valley fed the nation. Yeah. So, all kinds of fruits and trees and stuff like that. Yeah, the Midwestern area had cotton, guns. A lot of cotton there. The Midwestern area had so much drought going on at the time yeah. that California was where everything was happening. Everybody was coming to California to work, and uh, it was a time when uh, there wasn't much money, and people were just uh, scraping here and there, doing whatever they could to make a living. Yeah. And I was a member as a little kid. I used to go ahead of my dad on uh, picking cotton, and I'd uh, go up ahead and make a little mounds of cotton. I was only about five, maybe eight years old, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would, when he'd get to where I made a pile of cotton, he would put it in his bag. And he was making one penny a pound for all the cotton he picked a day. Everybody was getting a penny a pound. Mm -hmm. They used to call it the first picking. The second picking, they got two cents a pound. Really? Yeah, it was rough. The second picking must have been more yeah. difficult than the first picking. But as a kid at that age, you didn't worry too much about it because it was fun being out there, yeah. you know, with yeah. your folks. Yeah. Um, where did you go to school at then? I, uh, you talking in, about in grade school? Grade school and high school, middle, yeah, well, junior high and high we, school. Um, in the middle of, of the San Joaquin Valley, just uh, north of Visalia, there's a, a little town called Seville. And I went to school there to a, a grade school, kindergarten through eighth grade, called Stone Corral. Okay. I went there until I was, I was in the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And at that time, my dad uh, found a place to work up in the mountains uh, near Sequoia Park. And it was um, a 500-acre ranch that grew grapes, oranges, and um, lemons. And uh, my dad uh, was working there, and he, he, he got a house and didn't have to pay rent. The house had electricity and running water, which we didn't have mm -hmm. as younger kids. Mm -hmm. And um, we were there until the war started. Were you, um, was the high school at Sequoia Point then that and you went then, to? And uh, then when the war started in 1991, 1941, I was uh, 
just into my uh, junior year, and um, and I went to school there in a little town called Woodlake High School. Woodlake is is about 15, 20 miles uh, east of Isalia, California, mm -hmm. uh, near, near on the foothills where the the uh, trees are all oak trees, and then there's hills there. Yeah. So Pearl Harbor happened in December 40, 1941, when you were a junior in high school. I was I was just getting into my junior in high school. And. California was kind of the ep the the front of the United States because the worry of Japan. Yep. How um, what do you remember about learning about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Well, my neighbors and uh, my name my my neighbor was the foreman of the ranch, and he had uh, two boys my age and one younger, and we were out in the vineyard that day, December seventh. It was a Sunday. Mm -hmm. We were what they call stripping leaves off a vineyard so the sun could hit the grapes. So we came in at noon to eat. And I remember the radio was full of it, that we had been attacked by the Japanese in Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. That was a life-changing moment. From then on, we couldn't get away from the radio. Yeah. And um, everything started changing from then. Did you? Everything. And I'm sure you knew immediately that it was going to impact your life as well, being very, that age. Very much. Oh yeah. When school started, uh, you know, when we went back to school. Uh, I was in. A, I was a, a junior. Started in my junior year, and uh, all athletic events were cut in half. Mm -hmm. The schedule was cut in half. That was a bummer for us kids, and um, everything was being, um, you couldn't buy hardly any gasoline unless you had a certain kind of a stamp, mm -hmm. couldn't buy any tires, and I remember that things started to be rationed, yeah. butter, yeah. everything went to the, to the war effort, everything. Yeah. It was a time when everybody was behind the war effort, even us kids in school. We would buy 10 cent war stamps in school every week. They would go to the government. And uh, people started going to factories to work. Mm -hmm. No more car, no more new cars. No. They, they turned them into uh, to tanks, yeah. airplanes, and everything that had to do with, with the war effort. The women started working in factories. Rosie of the River came out of uh, that era where uh, they were working in uh, making airplanes. Yeah, a lot of airplane, Rib yeah, lo Rib airplane Rib factories yeah. in California. Um, well, they were all over the place, and they kept going there. Yeah. So yeah, it changed drastically. Did you finish high school then? I did finish high school. So I know a lot of some a lot of, of our, veterans uh, left early. Some of our guys didn't. Yeah, they left early. Student body president. I was only. Uh, 17 when I graduated. I had just turned 17 in May and I graduated. I was 17 May the 30th as a senior and I graduated May the 30th. By June, around the same time, I had already joined the Navy. So this is June of 1943. 1943. And um, you look pretty athletic today. I'm, I'm Probably assuming that you were on some sports teams while you were in high school. That was um, that was one of the reasons I, I, I liked high school because of athletics, and um, I played uh, baseball was my favorite sport, and, and uh, played basketball and I played football three sports uh, all the time I was in high school, mm -hmm. and. Uh, my um, my dream was to become a professional ball player, baseball, but then the war came and that ruined everything. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so when when you um, ended, entered the Navy, did you? Um, I'm sure there were recruiters coming to your high school 
and all of that stuff, or were there well, not? I didn't see any recruiters. They last they year. didn't come. Sometimes they went to the high schools yeah. if they had if they had enough staffing. Um, how did did you um, sign up for the Navy before you graduated? Uh, no, it was right after. Right afterwards. And, and uh, I, went, I went to Fresno. It was a big town there in California. Mm -hmm. To uh, to sign up at the Navy uh, recruiting recruiting station, and by July I was in San Francisco. At our um, boot camp training was in Treasure Island. Treasure Island, California, in San Francisco Bay, mm -hmm. was made uh, man-made island for uh, one of the one of the world's fairs, and that became uh, a military base to train sailors. That's where I went to boot camp. So it was a, a Navy Navy training center there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my grandfather, a lot of people, at least on the eastern half of the country, went to Great Lakes Training Station That's in, in North we were Chicago. Going, they were all full by then. Yeah. And this was brand new and uh, was taken over by the Navy and became a big uh, boot camp. That's one of the problems. They just didn't have enough instructors at those basic training camps. Right. Because they needed so many personnel right away, and they just weren't quite prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Did you? Um, how long were you in basic training then? I was there from uh, July until towards the end of the year, and then I was assigned uh, to uh, a transportation uh, department there on Treasure Island for a few months because. Um, Early in, uh, in 1944, around Jesse, January, right before, right around March, I got the orders to go overseas. Mm -hmm. And this is while you were still at Treasure Island yeah. with the yeah. transportation um, depot. Did you, um, where were your orders to overseas? We didn't know where we were going, Jim. They would, um, they would get us all together and uh, we would we would board a ship at one of the uh, piers there in uh, San Francisco. Uh, there were numbered I think it was number pier 39, and it was a big a, a big transport ship there, and it was they were loading it full of uh, Marines, Army, and Navy. And as you went up the gangplank, you carried your sea bag and a gun, a rifle. Mm -hmm. We didn't know as Navy guys, what are we going to do with a rifle? We didn't train yeah. with a rifle. What we were doing, we were transporting us. We were taking it. That's one way of, of taking a bunch of rifles from here to where they were going. Mm -hmm. And um, we didn't know where we were going, Jim. Didn't know, and they didn't tell us anything except we were going to our state. We wound up in Numea, New Caledonia. And that took around 15, at least 15 to 20 days because we were going slow and zigzagging and we went as far south as we could past uh, Hawaii and, and New Mountain, New Maya, New Caledonia is, uh, is, is uh, east of Australia, mm -hmm. kind of southeast. And that's how far south we went. Yeah. And the war, all the war was going up north in the Solomon Islands. Yeah. It was about a thousand miles away. They did a lot of their, yeah, a lot of the military operations were out of there. And, yeah. and even even the army was out of Australia yes. and they were conducting So what we on. had there, New Man, New Caledonia was a French colony. And uh, of course they were an, an ally of the United States and they had land there where where all the sailors would get in one spot, an army in one spot, and every day they would call you and say, you're going wherever you're going. Mm -hmm. We are there about a week or so. What was your military occupational um, Well, finally, I, got, I, got, I left New Maya, New Caledonia, and we headed to Guadalcanal. And Guadalcanal had just been taken over by the Marines just, um, just a few months. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had they had taken uh, the airstrip, which uh, called Henderson Field, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a 
a field that the Japanese had built and, and we had taken it over and, and built it better. And uh, I was I, w I went there for a few days and then I was assigned to, across the bay to another island called Tulagi. I was assigned to um, to shore patrol unit, and I stayed there doing all during the war, uh, just patrolling the island. And we're military policemen. We were mm -hmm. about 15 of us, mm -hmm. and uh, we patrol the island day and night. Um, when you were going back to basic training, um, did your basic training? I'm, I'm assuming that when you were patrolling the island, you were in some smaller smaller boats or what were you no we were in a jeep you were in a jeep so you were actually on the island on the island naval personnel on the island yeah. in a jeep that's pretty rare <laughs> that was a supply base uh-huh a supply base for all the um, ships that come in for uh provisions the the, the pt boats would come in there to get gas petroleum yeah, yeah. and um they, they would all come there and then leave because Tulagi was a small island, five miles around and one mile across. Mm -hmm. Guadalcanal was a huge island, but it had no, no, no harbor. Mm -hmm. No, you couldn't get close to the land. You had to, the ships would have to dock offshore, drop down a smaller boat with people in it, and then and, and go inland. Mm -hmm. But Tulagi had a, a big, uh, a, a deep harbor you could go right up to the land and uh, load up and then take off and uh, smaller ships would also come in there when you were training did you do I'm assuming you did a lot of um, water training and and boat training and ship training for jobs when you were we did, going through uh, the boot camp in uh, San Francisco was uh, we learned how to first learn how to march I had to put on a gas mask. They mm -hmm. put us in a in a bunker and lock us up there, and then you put your gas mask on when the gas is mm -hmm. turned on, and you come out of there coughing, you know, and all that. But what? But you learn how to do that, and you they, they put us on a a rowing. Uh, we would row it uh, on a bay, uh, a bunch of uh, long boats. Uh, a roar on this side and a roar on this side and you'd roar, you mm -hmm. row. But um, we just learned how to do that. Basically, we'd learn how to get along with each other, mm -hmm. depend on each other. Mm -hmm. Because uh, after we left there, we didn't do too much of that anyway. The Navy would, would take over. Yeah, yeah. So so did, you, did anyone assume they'd be patrolling in a jeep coming out of naval training school. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Not at all. I mean, most of the time when I hear training, it's usually armies doing training with the jeep that were driving around, and they're getting supplies from naval personnel coming in, you know, to the shore off of a off of PT or something different. But yeah. um, so so what are um what were some of your jobs when you were patrolling what are the things you were looking out for well and we um just like uh, military police uh, anywhere looking for anything and if anybody's in trouble or if anybody's speeding there's a lot there's a lot of movement there you know trucks and everything mm -hmm. uh sometimes you get called or something that happened uh some of the sailors there on Tulagi would make uh, would make whiskey out of rice. Where they got the rice, I don't know, but they would put it in tanks, and uh, they, we got called, come and come and dump it out. Mm -hmm. We had to go dump it out because it was nothing but trouble then. Yeah. But other than that, we didn't have much trouble. Uh huh. Uh, we we had a brig that uh, the, the ships would bring. Uh, Military people that uh, that um, misbehaved at sea for some reason or other, and they were they were incarcerated, and they would drop them off at us, and we put them in a brig, and from there they get orders, and they send them home back to the United States to another uh, another brig. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, that's what we did. Did they do any, um, ha have any trials or anything they did there, or they sent them elsewhere? Well, um, the, we had a, what they call a captain's mast there, but uh, for just th those are for the, the people that were on the island. Uh -huh. The people that came there from them and other ships, they've already been tried somewhere, and they were they were going to be sent back back to the United States. Uh -huh. And they uh, they were bad boys. Some yeah. of them. They got in bad trouble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How how um, what was your weekly um, working schedule? Were you on a lot of hours then off, yeah, or did you have normal the, hours? There was about fifteen of us, and we had. Uh, Take, we took turns uh, patrolling the island, and uh, so many days, you know, one day you're off, one day you're on, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Did you build up any good friendships of some of the other guys that a you were lot, patrolling a lot with? Of them, yeah, a lot of them, yeah. And I'm assuming you were from all over. All yeah, the, uh, they were from all over, from New yeah. York to the east coast to the west coast and north and south. Yeah. Yeah, you did. Did you, um, were there any incidents that came up on that was unique? Did you have to deal much with the civilian population at all? Or did you see many civilians? There were no civilians on, on, on the Solomon Islands are full of uh, native people. Mm -hmm. And uh, Solomon Islands were owned by the British uh, government. They were, they were colonies as they called them in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, after the war they they give them back their independence, and uh, to this day, I, I I know that England don't uh, don't own them anymore. Yeah. But um, Did, they were used as labor mm -hmm. for the British because they used to have uh, thousands of uh, palm trees there that grow coconut trees to make soap and mm -hmm. stuff, and uh, the natives would 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 pick them. Yeah. Did you um, did you see many natives when yeah, you were every day. Every, every day? Every day they'd come in and uh, and clean the island. Yeah, every day they'd have a a group of them would come in and uh, they would make sure that uh, if any coconut tree had coconuts, they'd knock them down so they wouldn't come down and hit somebody. Because hmm. they were always close to a building, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they were there just about every day. Yeah. Yeah. Were you working out of a naval naval headquarters or an or a army headquarters? Oh, no, naval. It, it, it was, was all, all naval operation. It was all navy. Okay. Yeah, they had uh, the hospital there, and they had uh, the officers' quarters, and then and enlisted men's quarters, and the workers' quarters. So, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, so Tulagi was pretty much all controlled by the navy. It was yeah, under all, their their management. That's, that's interesting, but like you said, it was a pretty small island um, yes. compared to yeah. Solomon or other Supply islands. Supply base, yeah. Um, were, were there ships coming in and out of there all the time? Yes, coming with in supplies? and out. Yeah. And personnel, I'm assuming, as well. Yeah, they, they would, uh, when a ship would dock there, for some reason or other, they would uh, let their people go off and they'd, they'd kind of walk around the area. Mm hmm there was no place to go see or no, no stores, nothing. Yeah. But at least they could get on land and walk, you know. Yeah, yeah. Did you find out, um, how, how up were you on the war news? Were you getting war news oh, every yeah, day? We had, a, we had a radio every, every, um, every, every day. We we listened to the news. We knew where the news were about how the Germans were, were being defeated. Mm-hmm. And uh, we knew all. We kept track of all that. Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, we we would like to listen to the radio because in those days the uh, Japanese had a, a a lady on the radio called Tokyo Rose, and they would play uh, the uh, the the songs from uh, from the United States, the American American songs, the band songs. Big band song yeah. to make us feel home, uh, homesick. Yeah, what they said. And she would uh, bring out the news. Uh, we would hear that they uh, that we had lost a lot of men here, a lot of men here. Propaganda, oh, a lot yeah. of propaganda. And then we had a 
So you 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 actually heard Tokyo Rose sure. then, because she was she was famous at yeah at expelling and showing Japanese propaganda. Actually, Tokyo Rose is from the United States. Yeah, I think Los Angeles, and she got caught in Japan during the war, and they kept her there. And uh, they also had another propaganda. They had a what we used to call washing ma machine Charlie. Hmm. Uh, he'd fly a plane over the islands just about every night or wherever. The islands are, the summer islands are huge, they're long. And um, he, they would come over the radio and say that, that uh, he had bombed this and bombed that, and you know, propaganda. Mm -hmm. He was called Washington Machine Charlie. Huh. I've not heard of him. Yeah, that was... Uh, yeah, I've heard a lot of Tokyo so we Rose. We that radio that would keep us up with uh, yeah. all the communication. I've heard a lot about Tokyo Rose telling yeah. everybody that their girlfriends are oh, dating yeah. back oh, home. Oh, yeah, and, it was uh, propaganda. And all the, the, the losses that Americans are taking, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so you, you were there in the middle of um, early 1944 then? Yeah, early 1944, yeah. And, and through. Um, of course, February 1944, no, 45. 44, there was a lot going on. The Philippines gradually was taken while you were there yeah. in the Pacific, and then they moved, obviously, by the winter of 44, 45, towards Iwo Jima as they were pushing yeah, that way. Yeah, they were way. pushing up north, yeah. Um, when I was there, when I got to Tulagi at night, we, could, we were so far south of the action that we would hear, we would hear bombs or... Mm -hmm. Well, whatever was going off at night, yeah, way way far away, yeah. And um, as soon as they got uh, a hold of the Solomon Islands up north, they start moving towards Japan, mm -hmm. and then it's not got to Guam and yeah. all up, up, up. Yeah, just start bombing Japan. Start inching closer to Japan. That's what they were doing. Yeah. Um, June 6, nineteen forty-four. You you were. Um, Probably heard that news then of the European or the, the D-Day that was going on and yes, things like that. Yes, we heard all that. Yeah, we heard all that. I'm I'm assuming morale was pretty good when you were in there because oh, yes. we were yeah. we were we were much different than in '42 when morale was down and we were taking losses. We were the war had changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we knew when uh, we heard when when the Germans got beat. And we knew it wouldn't be long, you know, before the Japanese. Then when they, when they dropped the bomb, we were there too. So you were um, you you spent your entire time there after you finally got in place with the with with your MP. I was there, I was there until the war was over. The the bomb dropped in 1945 in uh, August. In August. I think August. Yeah, the um, both of them. Hitler, Mussolini. Of course, they were all surrendered by yeah, May of 45, yeah. and. So, um, did you see any increase in personnel coming between May? Because there, there was a real fear that we were going to have to invade the island of Japan, and um, a lot of they military. To, yeah, they wanted to invade Japan, and uh, they knew they were going to lose a lot of men, and that's why they dropped the bomb. A lot, a lot save, of yeah, to save, to save uh, the military people. A lot of military personnel from European front. We're getting transitioned over to the Pacific War. Yes. Um, did you see an increase in that when no, the last? No, no. See, we were so so far south, and the island was so small; it, it couldn't take a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, that was going on, and then um, as we moved closer to Okinawa, and then then finally, what do we do with Japan unless yeah. they surrender? We were uh, Tulagi was strictly a. Supply base. That's all it is. Supplied mm -hmm. the ships with their 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 military needs, mm -hmm. and um, everything kept going north toward toward Japan. Ooh. And uh, I remember when the bomb dropped. Uh, everybody on the island was really happy. Yeah, because we knew that the war we were going to be coming home pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah, the sooner the war ended, the better. Um, less Americans yeah. were going to get killed. Japan wouldn't surrender until they dropped the second bomb, mm -hmm. and then they surrendered. Yeah, so you were keeping pretty much on the news and all oh, that yes. when that was yeah. all happening. 
Very much so, yeah. What did you think about the atomic bomb at the time? Did anybody know what it was? Oh, no. No, no. That was a very well kept secret. Mm -hmm. But uh, it came and they described it on the radio how, you know, how many got killed and oh my gosh. Yeah. The war's over. It was going to be over. Pretty amazing for yeah. one bomb. One bomb. Yeah. So, um, and of course, you were there when they, how did news arrive to you that the war was over, that the Japanese had surrendered? Do you remember that? The radio. We had a radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, we heard that when they had We were all, uh, we had a bell outside the, the what they call the, uh, the shore patrol shack. We had a bell outside and we went, we'd go out there and ring it. <laughs> Everybody was happy. I remember that, yeah. We're, we're getting ready to come home now. It took me a long time to come home, but uh, we, we did, most most of the guys would uh, would come home. Uh, it was a, They had a plan how to muster you out of the Navy. Uh -huh. The older guys would get out first. If they were married and had kids, they, they would get a lot of points. If you were single and not married, you were one of the last ones getting mustered out. Yeah. I was one of the last ones. <laughs> yeah. I uh, come home for a 30 day leave in, in November of 45 after the war was over. And I still had time to do so. I was assigned to the USS San Francisco, a heavy cruiser. They had been in, uh, in combat and it was stationed by that time in in Vallejo, California Navy Yard, and we took her through the Panama Canal and over to Philadelphia Naval Air Base and put her in mothball, mothballs. And that, by that time it was April, and I didn't get home until April for, for good mm -hmm. of 46. So you left, you, you left um, the Pacific though in November on the ship headed towards the I left there USS in San Francisco. November. Yeah, we got. I got home uh, late November. Yeah. And then from there, you took the USS San Francisco around to put in mothballs. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that well, was... I got enough points to, to to get mustered out of the Navy because mm -hmm. I had volunteered for for duration of the war. Yeah. I uh, I didn't vol I didn't sign up for four years. That was a four year hitch. I, I, I had a choice, duration of the Navy, I mean duration of the war, or a one-year hitch, which is four years. And that time I thought four years was a long time. And uh, luckily I, I was right. I, 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 uh, I didn't know how long it was going to last, but I signed up for duration of the war. Yeah. And I was in a total of 33 months, my Navy career. Almost three years. Almost three there. years. So where, where did you take the San Francisco to go to mothballs? Was where, where that in the East Coast then? Yes, we took her uh, uh, to the, the U.S. Navy uh, station at uh, Philadelphia Navy Yard. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia Navy Yard then. And they were, they were putting all the ships there from the war and put them in mothballs and decommissioned them. Mm -hmm. So we left her there. So we're um, just getting back um, to your time when you're an MP. Did a lot of those MPs, you said there were roughly 15 of you or so that were um, working there, did a lot of them leave earlier than you? Or were you one of the last uh, ones to leave the island? Some of them left. The, what had happened there, Jim, if, if you were there 18 months, you would get uh, uh, rest and recreation. And they would send you home for so many months. And um, by the time I turned and put in 18 months or more, uh, the, the war was just about over. Uh -huh. So they weren't doing it anymore. But yes, they would rotate people around and uh, give them rest, you know. Yeah, yeah. Was, was anybody that you worked with, did anybody get assigned to the USS San Francisco on your, on your voyage home? Uh, or? No. No, uh, so they kind of split you guys up quite a bit. Some oh, were going yeah, home. We, we scattered all over. Yeah. We didn't know where. What were you doing when you were on board ship on the way on the way home and then on the way 
around mothballed well, San Francisco. Well, I was assigned to a military police on board the ship. So you maintained that position yeah. all the way through. We were called master at arms. Mm -hmm. And when we kept order on the ship, you know, make sure everything was okay. And did you do that when you're on your trip back to the States from the islands as well? Uh, uh, no, when I come back from this, from the island, uh, it was a, uh, uh, a troop transport ship bringing okay. us home. Okay, yeah. just a regular transport ship. Yeah, then. that's what it was. Um, so when you when you ended up in Philadelphia at the Navy Yard, were you there very long, or did they? I was there from um, uh, December, January, February, March. So that's a few months. Uh, uh, yeah, because I was discharged in April. Mm -hmm. What did they have you doing while you were there? Oh, aboard the ship? Yeah, yeah. I was a, I was a uh, shore patrolman. You wore a badge, you know, a shore patrol badge, and you were like a policeman aboard the ship. So you were still on board ship while in Philadelphia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was still on it, and uh, I left her there. Uh -huh. and, uh, time for me to come home. Did you have weekend leave? Were you able oh, to go yes. on the town yeah. on the weekends? Sure. Sure, yeah, we could go into, into town of Philadelphia. I got to see the Liberty Bell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was probably a little bit of enjoyment that you hadn't had for a long time. Oh, yes, absolutely. Seeing a little bit of Philadelphia. Yeah. The other coast that you grew up on. <laughs> yeah, the other coast, yeah. So uh, that was uh, interesting being in Philadelphia Navy Yard. Uh huh. That was an old, old Navy Yard. Yeah. And, uh, we left there by by train. They sent us to California by train and dropped us off. I wound up in uh, north of San Francisco and uh, I forget what town. Then and then it started coming down and uh, and I uh, they dropped me off in San Francisco and from San Francisco I went home to uh, at that time was Madera, California. Mm -hmm. My folks were living there. I didn't. I had never been there before, during the war, and uh, I, I got there in April of uh, 1944, for good. So um, you were discharged then out of the naval yard in Philadelphia, or were you discharged I after was you got discharged back in to San Francisco? After you got back to California, yeah. they did the final discharge. Yeah, they dropped us off there and, and gave us the discharge papers and. We're home. Mm -hmm. What was your um, What was your your rank when you left? Boatswain's mate, second class. Second class. Boatswain's mate was uh, one of the highest non-commissioned rates in the navy at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the there was five ratings, and and uh, they're called right arm rates. They were the only ones that could wear a right arm rate on their right arm, and the boatswain's mate was one of them. Mm -hmm. Now everybody in the Navy wear, they wear them on the same arm. There's no discrimination. As far as where on your rank and all of that. Yeah. Um, when you when you came back, and you were discharged, um, did the did your military having been in the military did that help you benefit you at all later in life? Uh, I imagine. Uh, it helped. It was an experience that uh, that taught you how to get along with people. Mm -hmm. And um, when I came back from the Navy, my uh, I had to look for a job, and I sure didn't want to uh, work on a, on a farm anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> I did help my dad out. Uh, uh, my dad was. Uh, taking care of a 40-acre grape ranch at the time. I did help him up for a few months, and then I went into town and uh, and got a job with Safeway mm -hmm. in Madera, California. That was uh, one of my first good jobs, not in the field, not on outside, but inside, wearing uh, clean clothes, a little tie, mm -hmm. waiting on people. And uh, that was my first real, real, real job with Safeway. Did you work at Safeway quite a while? A few years. Okay. Then I uh, 
started doing other things. Mm -hmm. Did you take advantage of the of the GI Bill? Yeah, I did. I got a home. I got a home uh, uh -huh. at that time with nothing down. Yeah, that was a good. That was a good bill. Yeah, yeah, it did a lot of good things. Yeah. Um, did you remain in California then in your working life, your working career? Sure, I, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I got my job there at, at Madera, California, and, and I, I went to work for a. Uh, start getting into sales, and I started working for a furniture st company called the uh, McMahon Furniture Store. And uh, then from from there, I, I moved to uh, to Los Angeles in 1967, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a job with Los, Los Angeles Times, selling advertising for automotive advertising. Mm -hmm. I was there 20 years. And that's where I retired from. Sounds like you have a pretty good. I was, advertising. It first. was a good job. Uh -huh. I mean, it was a job that uh, didn't require being out in the out in the fields. Wore a tie and a suit every day. Mm -hmm. Had a car given to me every year. Insurance was paid for. The gas was paid for. It was it it uh, it. Uh, it ruined me because I didn't know too much about cars and I didn't have to because they fixed everything that yeah. went wrong with it. They took care of you. They took care of us. Did um, Did you have any other family members that served in the war? I had... Uh, my dad uh, remarried uh, after uh, my mother died when I was uh, in this... In a, I think I was in the seventh grade. And uh, I have a brother that's 14 years younger, and I got one that's about 15, about 17 years younger. Mm -hmm. And then they were the, the I got one brother, John. And he was in uh, in the Vietnam, and uh, my, my my other brother. Half brother, he went to. He just joined the Marines and was there a couple of years during peacetime, mm -hmm. and then he's back out again. Yeah, yeah. Is there um, are there skills that you learned in the Navy that you that helped you throughout the li throughout your life? Well, let me see. Um, other than uh, knowing how to get along with people, that was. Uh, that's a, a big thing that you can use anywhere you go. Sounds like you Especially use that really sales. well in sales. Yes, Especially in sales. He sold me. <laughs> That's where we met. So I met my wife in uh, L.A. Times. Really? Yeah. So that was uh, that was one good thing that came out of uh -huh. that. Yeah. So that was good. Do you have anything else that in in your military service that we didn't touch upon that you would like to say? Oh, well, let me see... Uh, No, I uh, I was uh, very blessed to be where uh, where I was assigned. Because when you join the military, you don't tell them where you want to go. They put you where, especially during war. Yeah. You don't know where you're going. No. You don't know where you're going. You're going to live very long. And um, I say I'm blessed because I I I came home. In one piece. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to go into the Navy? What was it about the Navy that you decided to enlist into instead of the Army? Or well, you always or, heard that the Navy and the Navy always had a, a good place to sleep and a good place to eat, and it was true. Mm -hmm. The Navy fed you well, and you always had a place to sleep on. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't have to sleep in a, in a foxhole. Yeah, and if you're aboard ship. Uh, you're, you you have a place to sleep, even if you're in the, in battle. You have a place to, to lay down. Yeah, sounds like you listened to advice before. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, and most of uh, some of my high school uh, buddies, uh, we had a small school, high school, mm -hmm. and there was uh, 
about uh, five of us that joined the Navy, the rest went in the Army. Yeah. 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 Well, if, there, if there's nothing else, um, we'll conclude the interview. If you can't think of anything else that you might want to say. No, I, uh, I just want to thank God that I'm still here. Well, I would second that. I yeah. thank God that you're here too, and you're doing very, very well. Yes, he is. Thank you. Thank you, well, Jim. Thank you, Pete, for your interview, and thank you for your service. Thank you.